please to go to Matthew chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 18. And we're going to be reading the story of Joseph today. Next week, we're probably going to be reading the story of Mary. But today, we're going to start with the story of Joseph. And I want us to, to talk about, about uh, uh, what makes Christmas so special, right? It is a very special time of the year. And I want us to look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 24. And I'm going to ask everyone to stand in honor of God's word. And we're going to read these verses and then we're going to get into it. Amen. It says this. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her or embarrass her publicly. So he uh, decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from uh, their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God's with us. Uh, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. Let's pray. Father God, over these next few moments, I pray that our hearts would be open to receive everything that you have for us, Lord. Lord, deposit in our hearts your word and your thoughts, Lord. Let it produce a fruit in our lives that will bring change, that will bring transformation, encouragement, whatever it is that we need. Lord, Father, not my words, but your words, not my thoughts, but your thoughts, less of me and more of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody says, amen. You may be seated this morning. You know, here we are, uh, here in the Christmas season, and for many individuals, uh, the Christmas season is not, it's, not a, it's not a great time of the year. It's, it's a challenging time of the year. In fact, many people uh, are experiencing, uh, uh, I would say, pain because it's maybe for the first time this year, uh, maybe they lost a loved one and now they're going through Christmas. They've gone through Thanksgiving for the first time, you know, with, without that loved one. And, and there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sorrow, there's a pain in their heart. And that's, that's to be expected when you, you, you lost somebody. So, so while others are rejoicing, uh, there are others that are hurting. And then, you know, you have, you have the pressure of Christmas, right? The, the consumer part of Christmas, the, the buying of presents. And you've got people overextending themselves, getting themselves into debt, buying more than they should. Come on, are you hearing me? It's going through all these lengths. And, and the intent is nice. It's to, to bless somebody, bless people that you, that you love and care about. But the fact is, is there's that pressure, that pressure to buy the right gift and to purchase something maybe, that, maybe that's beyond your, your reach, right? And so there's a the pressure that comes. There's the pain that comes with Christmas. There's a the pressure that comes with Christmas. And then, and then you go out and you're driving the streets, and depending where you're at on I-10 or 17 or the 101 or the 202 or, you know, all these different major, you know, roads, then there's the craziness that comes with with Christmas and traffic, how many of you know that there are a lot of people that need Jesus on the traffic roads? Come on, somebody, amen. Some of you need Jesus. I've seen you drive, amen. But uh, but you know what I'm talking about? There's that. It's just a crazy time out there, right? A lot of a lot of crazy drivers out there, and so things can get crazy and chaotic. And so I think that when we come to church, I think it's important that we do uh, during Christmas what we do every week of the year. Right. We're not necessarily changing anything that we do. We're, we're still doing the same things. You say, well, Pastor, what are we doing? I want to help you focus on the right things in, on Christmas. Amen. That, that I think it's, it's good. You have your, your parties, your, your festivities, your family events. It's all good. But, but I want to help you focus on, on Christmas and, and the significance of Christmas in your life. And, you know, I want to encourage you a little commercial break here. You know, uh, if you don't have plans on Christmas Eve, now I would love for you to come and join us at one of our two services. I know that I know that I know people they they have their festivities, but what does it say to our kids and what does it say to our teenagers and what does it say to our adult children and our families that before we we open one present, come on, that before we open you know one gift or before we sit down to eat one meal or unwrap the most important gift of all, the tamale on your plate. Come on, somebody. That before you do any of that, we're going to go to God's house, and we're going to focus on the real reason of Christmas. 
It doesn't mean that you're a sinner if you don't come on Christmas Eve. It doesn't mean that you don't love God. I know that you do, and, and many of us do. But I'm just saying this. What better way to really focus and to, and to get our kids and teenagers and our adult children and even ourselves to focus, right, and put the focus back on Jesus. Amen? Can I get an amen? Are there any amens in the house today? Amen? All right, and so, so I, that's my goal. The goal of this series is to help you focus on what we can get from the Christmas story and, and the story of Jesus. And so in, this verse, in these verses that we just read, we, we see the, the story of Joseph. And, and so we, we, we hear it from his perspective, right? And so today I want us to look at four aspects of this story. I want us to look at four things in this story, and I'm going to give them to you right now. Here they are. There's four things that I want us to look at at this story. Number one, there's a divine moment. There's a divine moment. Number two, there's a divine assignment. Number three, there's a divine purpose. And then finally, there's a divine promise, a divine. See, this is what Christmas is. It's when, it's when something divine came down to, he- to earth, excuse me, from heaven to earth. Amen. This divinity, something divine happened, something supernatural uh, happened in, in the earth. And so today I want to look at a, I want us to look at these four things, a divine moment, a divine assignment, a divine purpose and a divine promise. So let's start by talking about a divine moment. See, what is it that makes a moment a divine moment and, and more than just an, a regular moment or a good moment or a happy moment? See, what makes a moment a divine moment isn't that you're happy, isn't that you, you know, you open a present. What makes a divine moment a divine moment, listen, is it's when Jesus or when God enters the scene. When God enters the picture. Now, I want you to just, for those of you who don't know, the last book of the Old Testament is the book of Malachi, right? The book of Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And if you read the book of Malachi, you, you read the last uh, several verses, you're going to find out that, you know, God speaks through the prophet Malachi. And, and for, for those of you who don't know this, for, for about 400 years, God doesn't speak anymore. He doesn't speak to his people. He doesn't speak through a prophet. There's no word given to his people for about 400 years. So for 400 years, you could say that God was silent. He wasn't absent. Come on. He was just silent. How many of you know there's a difference between being absent and silent? And so for 400 years, he doesn't speak to his people. There's no word given. There's no prophecy given. There's no prophet to speak to them. And so for 400 years, there's silence. And so from Malachi, you know, chapter 4, the last verse to Matthew chapter 1, right? Come on. The, and, and Luke chapter 1. There's no word from God. He is silent. But then all of a sudden, he begins to speak. And he enters the scene. He enters the moment. Now, what I, what I find interesting about, you know, this interaction, this introduction, or this divine moment that, uh, that uh, Joseph and Mary have with, with the divine, right, with, with, with God in his presence, is, is this, is that they don't have a face-to-face or a, 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 a conversation with God. God isn't the one who presents himself to them. Now, in the Old Testament, we see that God spoke to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, what did he say? He said, you know what, I'm going to bless you. In Exodus, you know, chapter 3 or 4, we find that God speaks to Moses through a burning bush. In the book of 1 Samuel, we find that God speaks to Samuel and he says, you're going to anoint the next king of, of, of Israel, right? He, he directs him to, to, uh, to David. We see that God speaks to the prophets. He spoke to Elijah. In the New Testament, we see that the apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul, encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus through a bright light and he has this conversation with Jesus. And so there are many times where people, right, in the Bible had these encounters with God, right? And they spoke to God, and God spoke to them. But when God uh, creates this divine moment with Joseph and Mary, it's not God who speaks. Listen, it's an angel. It's an angel. Now, you would think that for such an important event that's about to happen, you would think that it would be God who speaks, right? I mean, after all, he's, he's got to tell Mary what's about to happen, and you would want that to be God. You don't want it to be just anybody, but God uses an angel, right? Now, I want you to hear this very clearly. It's a divine moment because, listen, God uses a messenger, right, to communicate what's about to happen. And so I believe that 
in our world today, watch, watch this, we need more messengers. Come on. I believe that the reason that God uses an angel, because another, one of the functions of an angel is to be a messenger. How many of you know that that's what our call is to be, amen? Our call is to be a messenger. I believe that we need more messengers to carry the message of Jesus Christ, amen? To carry the message of hope, to carry the message of, of, of peace and love and forgiveness. I believe that, that listen, you, wherever you are at this week, you can help create a divine moment for somebody. Maybe that person won't hear the audible voice of God, but maybe, just maybe, you can help create a divine moment by delivering a divine message from the Lord. Amen? How many of you know that your break room at your job can be, can be a place for a divine moment? Your school campus, come on, can be, a divine mo- can be a place where a divine moment happens. Come on, your college, your university, your vehicle, come on, Starbucks Cafe, come on, it, the restaurant, your life group. It doesn't matter where you're at. Any place at any time can be a moment where a divine moment happens, where somebody receives a message from God. You see, I believe that in our world, we, we need more divine moments. We're all in need of it. I mean, think about what your life would look like with a divine moment. What would your marriage look like? What would your family look like? What would your children look like? What would our community look like? What would our schools look like? What would our churches look like if we had divine moments when we were just allowing God to work through us? Come on. How many of you know that it doesn't matter what the world says, the world can't stop you from being a light. The world can't stop you from being a witness. The world can't stop you from praying. Now, I understand, you know, if you're in school or, or and you have a job, and what I understand that there are rules and there are expectations and guidelines, but how many of you know that if you're sitting at your desk, no one can stop you from praying to yourself? Come on. How many of you know that if you're in the break room, no one can stop you from living for Jesus? If you're at school, there's nothing that prevents you from praying for the peer next to you. There's no one preventing you from sharing your faith at the, at the, at the table in your break room, at the cafeteria. There's nothing stopping you from living for Jesus are you hearing me today and so I believe that there are people today in our world there are people today that surround you week in and week out at your job at your school in your community the stranger at the coffee house at the restaurant the person that that maybe you don't talk to very often but you see them occasionally they are waiting for a divine moment and what they are waiting for is waiting for somebody like you and me to declare a message See, I don't know about you, but, but how, many of in the, how many of you in this place have a message to give to the lost and the hurting? Anybody have a message to give? Has anybody been through something that God rescued you from? Has God helped you? Has God set you free? Has God overwhelmed you with his presence? Does anybody in this room have a message to give to the lost and the broken? See? Don't, don't allow, don't allow that to escape you. In other words, that what you've been through can be a blessing for somebody else. That what you've gone through, that the struggles that that God has gotten you through is a testimony and can be a witness to somebody else. That if God healed you, that if God set you free, you have a message. You have a message to give somebody and that message creates a divine opportunity. And just as God used that angel to be a messenger, today he can use us to present a message of hope, love, and peace to the world around us. That's what he said. That's what happened. There was a divine moment when the angel came to Joseph and Mary. And he said, listen, God's got a plan for you. Which leads to our next, assign- to our next point is there's a divine moment that leads to a divine assignment. There's a divine assignment. Now I want you... to to think about this for just a moment. God's message through the angel to Mary and Joseph was simple. I mean, it wasn't a complicated message. He said, Mary, you're going to become pregnant. You're going to give birth to my son. I mean, that sounds simple. That's kind kind of powerful, right? I mean, think about it. How would you like it all of a sudden? There you are going to bed at night, and an angel appears to you and says, hey, guess what? You're going to get pregnant, and you're going to have my son. That's exactly what happened to Mary. And Joseph's assignment was simple as well. 
You're going to marry her and you're going to support her through this. You're going to be there. You're not going to abandon her. I know that you try to push her aside. I know that you didn't want to embarrass her. I know that you didn't want to, you know, to, 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 to do anything that was going to, you know, that cause her, uh, you know, damage or whatnot. You didn't want to disgrace her publicly. I understand all that. He goes, but you're going to marry her. So I understand that the assignment on, on face value, just hearing it, it sounds simple, but but you got to put this thing in context, right? you got to put it in context because, in essence, listen, the, the divine assignment that, that God gave Mary and, and Joseph, listen, it, it wasn't what God was going to get to them, but it was, it was more about what God was going to get through them. He wasn't only just trying to get Jesus uh, to Mary and Joseph. He was trying to get Jesus through Mary and Joseph. See, your, your assignment, listen to this, when, when you come to faith in Christ, listen, your assignment it's not just getting the gospel to you. It's about getting the gospel through you. See, you know, I think about this very often. I really do. I think about the gospel very often. Uh, and I, th- I think about our, our mandate, our call, like how we're compelled. I mean, there are a lot of people that don't feel compelled to share their faith. They feel they, they, there's, there, there's nothing compelling them to, 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 be, to be proactive in sharing their faith. And, and let me say this. When, when I think of a person and I think of a believer who doesn't feel compelled to share their faith, I, I feel that that person in some capacity is disconnected from God. Because you cannot be connected to God in relationship and not, come on, and not be burdened by the things that burden God. It's impossible, right? You know how you can tell, watch, you know how you can tell when people are around me you get how when they're around me a lot, when they start talking like me, when they start using the same verbiage that I use, right? You want to know why I say, come on, somebody, a lot? <laughs> you want to know why? Because I hang around pastors that say that all the time. I hang around and I talk to pastor friends. That that's where we're always using the same lingo. Watch. You can't get connected with God in relationship and not begin to speak what God is speaking in his heart. And if you if you're not if you if you're not walking with an assignment, it's because you haven't you haven't connected with God the way you should. It's not doesn't mean that you don't love God. It's just listen. When I'm close to God, what burdens Him burdens me. What's important to Him is important to me. Are you hearing me today? And so there's a divine assignment. Your assignment is not to sit and watch. Your assignment is not to just let everybody else do the heavy lifting and you'll, you'll take the scraps from the blessings. Come on, somebody. Your assignment is not to watch everybody else do the work, let everybody else do the teaching, let everybody else do the preaching, let everybody else do the praying, let everybody else do the living. Listen, as long as some of us watch, some of us, we, we just want to ease into heaven. And guess what? When you come to faith in Christ, you'll get to heaven, but you're not living a life of significance and meaning. You're not living and you're not fulfilling your assignment. You know what you're like? You're like the teenager living in the basement playing video games. Come on, somebody. Come on. That's not, that's not living. Listen, if God wanted you to sit and not share your faith, guess what? The moment you, gave, you said yes to Jesus, a chair would have magically appeared right next to you and say, have a seat. You know what I think we should do with Believers. After they get saved, we should give them a good kick. No, no, I'm playing. I'm joking. I'm joking. We love them. We, we, we hug them, and then we push them to the next steps class, right? We get them saved. We get them established. We get them discipled, and we see multiplication. See, although the assignment, watch, the assignment was simple, right? It was not easy. I want you to think about this. It required a great personal cost to Joseph and Mary. The Bible tells us in, in Matthew chapter 1, at the end of, uh, in verse 24, it says this, when J- Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. In other words, he obeyed. Everybody say obedience. obedience. How many of you know that obedience is easy? Anybody? Is obedience easy? Love your neighbor. Hey, that's, that's easy. How about love your enemy? Not easy. Get to heaven. That's easy. Okay, serve me here on earth. Not easy. How many of you know that, that Joseph had to obey? But Mary not only had to obey, but Mary, her, her price was sacrifice and surrender. If you read the story in Luke chapter 1, 
It says, let it be done according to your will. What was she saying? Not my will, but your will be done. She was surrendering. She was sacrificing. Now, now I know that, that for many of us, we, we look at this story. We thought, oh, they, got, you know, they had a disagreement. Now, you, you got to put everything in context. People, people in that day just didn't get married quickly. There was no Vegas that they just went to and went through a chapel. In those days, when someone was, was committed to one another and they were engaged to be married, the, the man had to prepare a home. The man had to get ready to be married. It, it, it often took many, many months, up to a year, even longer, preparing the home, getting the home ready, getting ready for his new wife, for the family that was going to be. And so, so Joseph had done all the preparation. And I want you to think about this. His fiance shows up and says, Joseph, I'm pregnant. Come again? Say, say again, what was that? Yeah, I'm pregnant, but don't worry, Joseph. It's not what you think. Come on, think about that. It's not what you think. Now, for just a moment, if you're a parent, put yourself in Mary's parents' position. Mary shows up to you, parent, and says, at the age of 16, 14, 15, I don't know how old she was, but she was a young lady. And she comes to the parent and says to the parent, hey, I'm pregnant. Joseph? No, no, it's not Joseph. Who is it? Oh, don't worry. It's the Spirit of God. That's exactly what happened. And she goes to her her, her fiancé and she says, it's the Spirit of God. Don't worry, Joseph. It's not what you think. I haven't been cheating on you. The angel came to me at night and he says that I would get pregnant with the, with the Son of God. You're crazy, Mary. What have you been smoking? Now, he, he decides to end this, this marriage that hasn't, or this engagement, right? And so now she goes on her way. And then that night, the angel appears to him and says, listen, this is of me. What, what she has told you is right. And I need you to get, I need you to marry her and be her husband. So now they're engaged. Now let's just look at this from a, from a practical point of view. What are the families thinking? What is Joseph's parents thinking about Mary? Come on. Could you imagine the conversations that they're having? Now think about Mary and Joseph walking through the streets. Going through the market and everybody sees that she's pregnant. How many of you know that, in, that it'd be very easy for people to be critical of her? Can you believe what she did to Joseph? Poor Joseph. Look, she hurt. She betrayed Joseph. Man, Joseph, he's such a good man. He's got his own business. He's a carpenter. He's a good man. But man, he's really dumb. How could he? How could he? And then they, 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 you know, they turn on him and poor Joseph. And then now he's dumb Joseph. And, jo look, and Joseph, and he's just he's going along with this. And look at Mary. Look at her. Look at Mary. And, 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 and they, they start naming her all these. She's, there's, 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 she's such a floosy. Come on, somebody. Amen. She's loosey goosey. Amen. All of a sudden, all the things. All the things are being said about Mary. She has to hear him. He has to hear him. This is the great cost. Come on. This is the great cost that she has to go through, that he has to go through. Let me tell you something, church. This is why many people don't want to accept the divine assignment, because they know that there's going to be some pain involved. See, our assignment is simple, to get the life-changing message of Jesus through us and to the world. It requires both obedience and surrender. And our faith is not about so much what God can get to us, but what God can get through us to others. Amen. It's a divine assignment. We know what our assignment is. It's not, it's not hard. If you haven't been listening, listen, I don't know what's wrong with you, but it's very simple. If you've been here less more than a month, you already know what our assignment is here at Lifeway. Preach the gospel, make disciples. That's it. Simple. Here's, here's the other thing. Number three is the divine purpose. See, our, our assignment is what we're called to do. Our purpose is why we're called to do it, right? Our assignment is what we're called to do, and our purpose is why we're called to do it. And J Joseph and Mary's assignment was tied to a divine purpose. Your assignment to preach the gospel and make disciples is always tied to a purpose. And, and Joseph and Mary's assignment was always tied to a divine purpose. And this is, it's found in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, where, where, where uh, the angel says this. He says, Jesus came to save the people from their sins. 
And this child will save the people from their sins. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. This remains and will always be the heart of God. To save people from their sins. Not to condemn them. Not to judge them, but to save people from their sins. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so, so what was the purpose? The purpose was to save people. Listen to me loud and clear. This will not be the last time that you hear this. People matter to God. Let me say that again. People matter to God. All people matter to God. Broken people, hurting people, lonely people, sick people, lost people, depressed people, (laughs) sinful people. Come on. Bad people, evil people. They all matter to God. You are surrounded by people that matter to God. The crazy neighbor, the crazy co-worker. Come on. The cousin that nobody wants to be around. They all matter to God. Are you hearing me today? People matter to God. That's why Jesus came. And our divine purpose is tied to people. There is no one, listen to that, there is no one that God doesn't love. No one. As people of faith, we should be driven by this purpose to see people experience God's love, God's forgiveness, God's salvation, God's deliverance, God's freedom, God's blessings, God's goodness, God's power, God's healing. Are you hearing me? This should drive us. This should compel us to share our faith. But see, what happens is, listen, if you've been in church over a year, can I tell you what happens sometimes? Is that we're no longer driven by purpose, but we're driven by preference. The longer that you are saved, the longer that you have come to faith in Christ, the more time passes that if you don't keep that fire fresh, if you don't keep that purpose fresh in your heart, and you don't keep on stirring it up, and you don't keep on looking at people through the lens of compassion, listen, what happens is, is that we become driven by preference instead of purpose. Are you hearing me today? And watch, what, well, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, I prefer this in the church, and I prefer this kind of chair, and I don't like chairs, I like pews, and I don't like speakers and, and, that, and drums, I like organ and, and, and piano, and I don't like organ and piano, I like guitars, and I like acoustic guitars, and I like slow songs, and I, like, I don't like a, a modern church, I want a traditional church, and I don't like... And now all of a sudden things become about your preference instead of about the purpose. Come on, are you hearing me today? See, this, when I'm talking about preference and purpose, this is what kills churches. It's what causes churches to get stagnant. It's what causes your faith to get stagnant because instead of looking at people who are lost and going to hell without Jesus, you're looking at things in the church that you don't like and you feel compelled to give your opinion about them. And you, could, and you lose sight of what's important to God. Can I tell you something? God doesn't care about our decorations in this place. God doesn't care about what you're wearing in this place. He doesn't care if we're a contemporary church, a modern church, a traditional church, a blended church. He doesn't care. What he cares about is this. Are you preaching? Are you faithfully reaching people for the gospel? Huh? See, we can't, we can't be driven by our preference. Because if you're driven by preference, that tells me that in some way you're disconnected from the purpose of God, which is people. See, I mean, do you, do you wake up? Do you, how, do, how does your faith compel you to share your faith with others? I want you to just think about that for just a moment. It's not just a divine purpose, but it's also in the story we find a divine promise. I love it because God reassures Joseph and, and he lets him know that all that has happened is part of his plan. But the promise can be found in Luke chapter 1, verse 28. Listen to this verse. When the angel of the Lord appeared to, to, to uh, Mary, he said this, Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. So I want you to see what, what God does in this moment through the angel. He says, to, he says to Joseph, he says, listen, this is part of my plan. He says, I'm in this. But then he says to Mary, I'm with you. Why, why is this important for us to know? Why is it important for us to know that God's in what we're doing and that he is with us? Because how many of you know that if God's not in it, then we're, what we're doing is useless? Come on. Listen, this is why we, we need him in our families. This is why we need that divine moment with God. 
Because I, I have something to tell you that, that without God, we're all destined to fail. Our, our, our lives are destined to fail. We're destined for heartache. There's people out there, I'm going to do it on my own. And, and guess what? They try hard and, and they, they try to make things happen on their own. Can I t- without God, we're lost. So we got to know that what we're doing, God is in it. Huh? See, sometimes, how I many know that life is hard? And sometimes we're like, man, God, am I doing this right at home? I mean, am I, am I, man, am I just messing my kids up some more? If you're, if you're connected to God and you're doing what God's told you to do, no matter what anybody says, God's in it. But, 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 I, but I, I'm, I'm going through hardship. God's in it. Do it God's way. God's in it. But how come it has to be so hard? God's in it. Why do I have to be attacked and criticized? God's in it. Why does this feel? God's in it. Why? Why is God in it? Because here's the other thing. God makes a promise. Here's a promise, a divine promise. He says, I am with you. I know you're getting criticized, Mary, but I'm with you. I know that people are talking about you, Joseph, but I'm with you. I know that the public is, is saying things about you, and they're, they're, they're raising up rumors and accusations. Come on. If, if, if Mary and Joseph were, were walking through a, a Latino community, all the chismosos would be out there. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about? You know, all of a sudden, those chismosos, they come out, the, the gossipers, the murmurers, and God says to Mary and Joseph, don't worry, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Listen, I know, I know you're going through a hard season. I know you're going, but, but listen, you need to hear this. I'm with you. And what something's about to happen something's about to come from you amen something's about to come through you amen and that which is about to come through you is about to change the course of the world so just stay strong i know that your flesh is weak i know that you're emotionally you're troubled but i want you to know something you don't have to face this alone because i am with you i know life gets hard church i know that sometimes i know sometimes we get tired. I know that sometimes we get weary. I know sometimes doing the right thing is hard. I know sometimes we just want to throw in the towel and say, let somebody else do it. Let somebody else do the praying. Let somebody else do the teaching. Let somebody else do the serving. Let somebody else do the life group. Let somebody else do the school of discipleship. Let somebody else give in the offering. Let somebody else go on that missions trip. Let somebody else serve. Listen, God says to you and to me, I am with you yeah i mean i want you to think about this you know you go to the old testament and this is what moses said moses said this very thing at the end of the book of exodus you go and you look at it the very last chapter god tells him to move and he says i need you to move the people move them along and this is what god this is what moses said to 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 uh to god he said listen if you don't go with us i'm not moving And so you need to hear this loud and clear today, that in your service, God is with you. In your prayers, God is with you. Through your faithfulness, God is with you. Through your giving, God is with you. Amen. Through your struggles, God is with you. God is with you. And don't let anybody tell you any different. And I know that sometimes our flesh will, will, will puff itself up or, or, or our flesh will rise up. And the enemy knows that. And he sees our discouragement. And he sees, you know, the, 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 the things that we go through and the struggles that we go through. Are you hearing me today? I understand that all, all that happens. But here's what I do know. I know this, that the moment I wake up in the morning, I know that God has been with me through the night. And the same God that was with me through the night is the same one who's waiting for me when I wake up. And he's with me when I go and I walk throughout the day. Amen. And that's why, that's why the psalmist could say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. He's with you today. You see, there's a divine moment. There's a divine assignment. There's a divine, there's a divine purpose and a divine promise. I believe that is what God is saying to us today. For those of us who are willing to walk in him and with him, he's saying, I'm in this and I'm with you. Today, as we we conclude today, and as we conclude this this teaching, I want you to think about this for just a moment. You don't have to... You don't have to struggle with insecurity. You don't have to struggle with despair. You don't have to struggle with fear and doubt. You don't have to struggle with these things in your life. 
Let God embrace you today. Let God embrace you today right there where you're at and experience your divine moment today because I believe that you're here for a reason. God wants you to have a divine moment today. Can I get an amen? God wants you to have a divine moment that that today is going to change your tomorrow. That what you experience here today at church, is gonna, it's going to set the tone for the rest of the week. Come on. It's going to set the tone for the rest of the week. Let God embrace you. Let God embrace you.